So thank you all for uh, your patience as we work through some technology issues. So um, I promise you it's going to be well worth it. So we have a fabulous presentation by Dr. Ortel, and um, he is an avid Jayhawk fan. He's done his all of his education at the University of Kansas. So he is a Jayhawk through and through. Um, and with that, in the interest of time, I'm going to just turn it over to Dr. Ortel. So thank you all so much. Okay, yeah. Oh, I'm going to put this down a little bit. Thank you, everybody. I had technical issues. I like to say we, we crashed the website. I've heard there's <laughs> a lot of people wanting to hear about my talk. So thank you for all showing up. So, yep, and this this is a talk, I forgot to change the little title here. I've given it before, but I've made some changes to um, be more, um, more interesting, if you will, um, and to highlight some things. So it's Diabetes 101. I've heard you guys talk about um, a lot of other topics. So I thought this one was one that has not been shared yet. So, oops, let me see. How do I advance? If you just want to hit enter, enter. okay, back. it is. Yeah. All right. So diabetes, what is it? Um, we all have heard the term um, diabetes. It is a chronic health condition. Um, it's essentially your body is unable to process your food um, into energy and for your energy to be utilized by the body efficiently. Um, typically, when our, we eat something that is sugary, our blood sugar goes up. Um, in a normal functioning system, our pancreas increases our insulin. And that is the essentially the key that the body uses to open up the door to put the blood sugar into our cells. So that's our brain cells, our heart cells, muscle cells, any, any cell in the body usually um, will use glucose or sugar to help with its functioning. Uh, but if there's not enough insulin, the body can't respond to the insulin then the blood sugar um, stays in the blood um, and doesn't get to where it needs to go. And over time, usually over years and years, um, it can lead to heart problems, eye problems, and even kidney problems. And I like pictures. Um, so this is just kind of a flow sheet of what I may have just said right there. So foods, especially with carbohydrates, those are foods that are found in um, fruits, grains. Um, so this is a nice pasta meal but it's also found in rice. And then the obvious sweet things like sodas and candies um, that is turned into glucose that then eventually should get sent into your cells and make you feel like you have energy. Um, so most commonly in America, people have type two diabetes. Um, I'd say in America, if you say you have diabetes, a 90% chance you're gonna have type two. Um, that is typically diagnosed in adulthood, and it usually um, comes on over a matter of years and years. Um, a lot of times we don't have any symptoms, so it can be a little bit tricky. Um, if we begin to have symptoms, it's because the blood sugars are really quite high, um, usually in the two and three hundreds. Um, but a lot of times we want to catch it um, sooner so we can provide earlier therapies. Um, and risk factors. Um, is, I have something in the middle of my screen here. Risk factors are really um, people above the age of 45. Um, we should probably screen them all. That's the, the latest recommendation. But after age 35, it can really go up, especially if there's a family history, if there's obesity, um, if there is high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, or if a, a male or female have wider waist circumferences. Um, if people have had gestational diabetes when they were younger, um, or if they're on chronic steroids for certain conditions. Next, there we go. And again, a picture. Um, this one, um, I'll kind of skip over just in sake of time, because it's something that I have said before, but it essentially says type two diabetes is where your body makes the insulin but your body's not able to respond to it to get the sugar where it needs to go. All right, and gestational diabetes. Um, this is diabetes that women get only when they're pregnant. Um, it usually happens if they have a risk for developing diabetes in the first place, if they've had prediabetes before. 
Um, really what causes it is some pregnancy hormones from the placenta actually that enhances their insulin resistance to a point where their sugars become um, elevated. And we, and we screen for that typically about 24 weeks with a oral glucose tolerance test. You drink something really sweet and then you do some blood sugars um, one, two, and three hours later. And typically with most women that will go away but it is a precursor to developing diabetes later in life. All right, in type one, um, that is about 5% of cases. That is diagnosed in childhood, typically. Um, it's where the body forms antibodies that attack the pancreas and the pancreas stops making insulin. This really typically happens after viral infections when, when we're in um, elementary school or middle school. Um, that could be mono, that could be the flu, that could be mumps back in the day before vaccinations, even COVID. I've seen quite a few college age kids who um, developed COVID and then a few months later or even weeks later, um, they're in the emergency room with um, really high blood sugars. Um, so with type one diabetes, they have to take insulin um, or else um, it is deadly, unfortunately. Um, that came up a lot with the cost of insulin um, being skyrocketing in the last decade where unfortunately a lot of people passed away because they couldn't afford their insulin. Um, but that's slowly getting better um, from a lot of the big companies who make insulin. Um, yeah, currently we don't know how to prevent or cure diabetes, but there's a lot of smart people working on this. Um, there is a new... It's an IV treatment, super expensive, but it came out last year that it's for people. It's usually we catch um, people who would benefit from this if you're a twin and your brother had diabetes. They would check you to see if you have these markers and give you this. Um, it's, an, it's an antibody test or antibody treatment where it can delay the onset of diabetes for up to two years. Um, two years doesn't seem like a long time, but it um, is helpful to get everybody's ducks in a row, if you will, um, to help that maybe eight-year-old kid who may develop diabetes then at 10. And that's just the beginning of the pipeline. So hopefully smart people, this came from Harvard, I believe, um, they can have more and more technologies and therapies coming out. All right, and this is a picture, kind of, like I said, I, I like pictures. Um, essentially, you don't have that, that key, that insulin to help open up this sugar to get into the cells. So all of this sugar just sticks in your blood system and um, can cause really high blood sugars really fast. All right. And one of my, um, I guess, mentors at KU, he often um, called diabetes the the, the, di the, the uh, disease of number ones. Um, so it's most likely the most, um, the number one reason for heart disease, especially um, heart attacks, strokes in America. It's even the number one reason why people in America can become blind. Um, number one reason for kidney disease and the number one reason why people get on dialysis. Um, the number one reason why people can develop um, amputations that are not from traumas. So very up, up, up beats um, slide right there. So apologies. Um, and I, I think also a complication of diabetes, kind of what I hinted at before is it, it's a lot, there's a lot of money that goes into diabetes. Um, insulin's expensive. Um, certain medications that are popular nowadays, like Ozempic, if you've heard of that on the news, that's one up in price. So we can see from in just five years time from 2012, to 2017, and that's, you know, five and 10 years ago, um, the cost of diabetes went up by, what's that, about $80 billion. So nowadays, gosh, it may be closer to 400 billion. Um, yep, statistics real quick. We can see that things have been, um, the risk of diabetes or the people with diabetes have been increasing. Um, we think that goes along with, with obesity. Um, but currently, um, this is 2017 data, but probably 30 to 35 million people in America have, have diabetes, and it's one over 10% uh, with some of the last data. Um, Pre-diabetes is even more people. It's probably about 35% of Americans 
have prediabetes with, a, with many, many millions don't even know that they have it. Um, going forward, um, and this, oh yeah, this is, this actually works. So yay. So this is the, um, the obesity epidemic that began in the mid nineties, um, where this is the yellow people are um, 14 to 18 percent of their population who are considered obese with a BMI greater than 30. And then this is six years later, where yellow took over all of America. And even in the South, there's about 20% of people who were considered obese. Fast forward 15 years, the one lone yellow state is Colorado, maybe the skiing and the activity that people do out there. And really the rest of it has turned to the vast majority of people having, di um, having obesity, above 26% of their population. And with that, diabetes came along with it. We can see the colors kind of following suit from 20 or yeah, 1994, 2000, and then 2015, um, especially in the South and in the Southeast where a lot of diabetes is seen. I think some communities like in Mississippi and Alabama, it's up to 50% or higher of patients um, can have diabetes in certain communities. All right, and I get a lot of questions. In, oh, wow, it's going fast now. I get a lot of questions in my clinic about blood sugar. It's going to be doing this about blood sugar monitoring. Um, I was just going to give like maybe two slides really quick, and it's probably going to flip back again. I thought so. I'm not going to fight it anymore. So what I was going to say was back in a long time ago in the 1800s. Um, and I think the early 1900s, how did we measure blood sugar? A, we didn't, or B, you had strips that you urinated on. And it would really give us like a plus or minus. <clears throat> so either it's negative, that just really told the person that we know now, is that your blood sugar higher than 180 or less? Negative sign would be less than 180, higher than 180 would be a, a plus sign. And people would dose their insulin based on just simply knowing that. Um, then later on, um, it's been years later where we started putting blood sugar or sh uh, blood onto strips. That was in the mid 1990s with this little device that is um, here. Um, you'd have to do things perfect. You'd have to wash your hands. You'd have to get a strip. You'd have to put it on this strip for a minute. And then the accuracy of those were really not that great. It would maybe get you within 50 points of where your sugar was. Um, later on in the 1980s, we finally got some displays, um, some digital displays. And that's where a lot of our current treatments or, or, or glucometers are. We can get blood sugar readings on a small, small, small drop of blood within three to five seconds with accuracies within typically five to 10 points of where they actually are. And that's really, I think, that's really, I think, gonna be outdated um, here in the next few years, hopefully as insurances get on board, because now we have continuous glucose monitors. They're essentially stickers that are on the body that measure the sugar that is found between cells. So with a traditional blood sugar monitoring, you have to puncture the skin to the point of the blood vessel or the capillary. It will ooze out blood and you measure the blood that's in, or the sugar that's in the blood. Nowadays, there's a sensor that measures the sugar between the cells in the, the skin layer. And there's multiple ones that are on the market that I'll show you. Those can give you blood sugars every one to five minutes um, to a device. Um, so the pop most popular one, there's a Super Bowl ad I noticed with Nick Jonas, if anybody saw that during the Chiefs um, Super Bowl, um, where he was showing the G7, the newest uh, Dexcom sensor, because um, he himself has type 1 diabetes. It's one of the smallest and most accurate ones that are on the market. Um, it's a personal favorite of mine if insurance will pay for it. Um, super accurate. It can go to your phone. It can go to this device. And what's nice with kids is with this smartphone, you can share it with up to five family members or friends. 
So like I said, with an eight-year-old um, who's at school, a mom can keep track of his her, her son or daughter's blood sugars while at recess, while at lunch. Um, and what happens with a lot of schools is this also gets shared with a school nurse. So they can watch the child and pull them out of class and give them some, sh um, some sweets um, or insulin if it's too high or too low. Um, other ones that are on the market is Freestyle. They're also really great. Um, a Freestyle 3 came out um, a handful of months later. It's a rival Dexcom um, with its accuracy. And you can see the size of these things. These things are super small. Um, the Freestyle 2 is about the size of a quarter. And um, like I said, a handful of months ago, they came out with one that's even smaller, about the size of a penny. And these sit on the back of our arm and just sit there for up to two weeks and relay information about our blood sugar to our, our devices. Um, and there, there are some that people have not heard of quite yet, probably. We just have a few people in our office with these. The one is called a Eversense. This little device is inserted into the body, typically under the arm, the skin on the arm. This is about the size of a grain of rice. Um, it is there for six months and soon to be 12 months where it can transmit blood sugar to a phone. Um, really comfortable, really accurate. Um, and there's also a Medtronic sensor that people usually use if they're on a Medtronic insulin pump. So, and I like to pull this one out. So this is Quincy. Quincy is a koala bear. Unfortunately, he had type 1 diabetes. Um, he was living in the San Diego Zoo. And surprising, not surprisingly, but Dexcom um, is, I think, right across the street, their headquarters in um, San Diego. So to help the, the animal out who had type 1 diabetes, they shaved a spot on his back and put on a Dexcom um, and that helped him, um, I guess with koala bears, type 1 diabetes is essentially deadly, but this helped him live for a few more years. I think he unfortunately has passed away since I've, I made these slides. But this was um, something needs a little collaboration between Dexcom and um, San Diego Zoo. Um, okay, and then... Where do we like blood sugars to be? Um, I'll first tell you where we like them to be, and I'll, then I'll give you some research of how we got there. Um, so I'm sure when you go to your doctor's office, if you have diabetes, they're asking, what's your blood sugars? Where are they? Um, ideally, the American Diabetes Association would say a fasting or a blood sugar before a meal should be maybe between 80 and 130. And if you do check it two hours after eating, hopefully less than 180. And if you can meet those marks continuously, then your A1C is most likely going to be 7.0% or less. And that's the goal we have for most adults. Um, I will say for younger kids, um, um, college age kids and kids in their 20s, I may try to push that down lower to six and a half. Um, and like it's saying here, if I see people, they're older, I mean, define old, um, if I had really had um, vibrant, you know, 80 and 90 year old patients, um, if, and I've had, you know, people who are um, not as vibrant at age 60. So if we anticipate having them get strict control may enhance, um, um, enhance, you know, comorbid conditions or, um, lead to lead to dangers that we let the a1c goals be higher and that could be even as high as nine for certain people okay now we're gonna i'm gonna get even um this is more research and sorry hopefully everybody's had some coffee um while i go through these next couple slides this is just getting to the the brunt of the matter like how did doctors come up with these numbers and why do we want these blood sugars to be where they're at um, so the diabetes control and complication trial um, was one that happened in the early 80s to early 90s. And that looked at people with type 1 diabetes of how, how low can we go with the blood sugars to prevent complications. Um, so they were put into intense therapies to get their A1C to 7. 
And usual conventional therapies at the time was just to keep their blood sugars okay, but not great, between 100 and 250, and that means A1C of about nine. Um, and, that, and with that study, they showed, yeah, with the intense treatment, there was really significant reductions in any of the complications of diabetes, and people are living longer. So there is a 25% reduction in eye disease, um, kidney disease started in 50% less patients, and nerve damage, um, the numbness and tingling of our toes and our feet that can happen with diabetes was one-third less. So we just knew that the people, if their A1Cs were seven, they had much less complications, and they, they, did, they did better. So that kind of set the goal forward of trying to get most people's A1Cs to seven, including people who had type 2 diabetes, which really back in this time in the 80s and early early 90s, really wasn't that many people. It just it, like I said with the, the slides ago, the incidence of type 2 diabetes has really skyrocketed in the last 20 years or 25 years even. All right, another nerdy study. Um, this is from England. It's called the UK PDS. This was a study, really long study, um, over 20 years, um, studying 5,000 people in the United Kingdom about similar things, if you will. Um, if we intervened and um, tried to get their A1Cs down from eight to seven, would that help lower their, their risk? And at that point, we really didn't have many great medications. We had a very old, well, it's, it's state of the art back then, but an insulin called NPH. Nowadays, we can call it Novolin N or Humulin N. Um, that is an insulin that lasted, lasts for about 12 hours in your body, and people were injecting it morning and evening. We had a, um, a class of medicines called sulfonylureas, and we still use these um, every day in America. The most common one is glipizide and then metformin. Those were really the main medicines we had for diabetes back then. So with that study, they were trying to get A1Cs from eight to seven, and they again noticed reduction in um, um, certain illnesses. So microvascular means the small blood vessels that are found in the, the back of the eye, our kidney, and um, that go, and also that go to nerve endings. So they saw all those complications go down. Um, heart disease was lowered. Um, and what's really interesting, I thought from this study, um, is people who got their A1C down to seven, um, even for a, a few years time, people noticed positive results that lasted for a decade. Um, even if their A1C went back up to eight and nine. Um, there's something called, this is, again, sorry, nerdy things, but um, uh, metabolic memory for people who really get good control for years right when they get diagnosed. That can last for, like I said, decades after they get, di after they get diagnosed, even if the control worsens. So overall, those two slides really just focus on why, why, do, why do your doctors want your A1C at seven or less? Um, let me skip over this one because this, uh, this is saying much of the same thing. This is a bigger study that happened later in life or later, later on from those two. And they just asked if 6.5 was even better. Um, and essentially, yes. And that also studied a blood pressure medication that is similar to one we use all the time called lisinopril to help keep kidneys and heart healthy. And essentially it was, it was showing a lot of the same where we could reduce complications and especially we helped reduce kidney problems even further with this medication. Um, and so that's why a lot of times our doctor or your doctors will be um, pushing or suggesting um, blood pressure medicines, even if you don't have a blood pressure problem per se, because it can um, improve your kidney health um, and prevent kidney problems. All right, any any questions? I'm not sure if anybody has any questions out there. I'm going to change things up and talk about kind of lifestyle changes and um, a few words on medication. 
Doctor, we have a, a group of questions that have been coming in. I've just in the chat room and I've been saving them up. So I think the easiest way is just kind of go through those and get caught up to where we are now. Okay. Um, one of the early questions was uh, the continuous monitor devices that you put on your skin. Uh, do, do they in any way puncture the skin? And if not, the other question that went with it was, how are they checking blood sugar if they're on your skin? Yep. So they, so when you apply to the, the, the device, it's, uh, it's applied every 10 or 14 days. It does use a needle that will puncture the skin in a millisecond. And then when it retracts back, it leaves behind this catheter that you, hopefully you can see on your end. Um, so th it does poke you once. Okay. And how does it measure sugar? Well, I think, I think you answered the question because I okay. think they were trying to figure out if it was remotely somehow and the skin was a barrier, how it was doing it. Oh, okay. So there oh, are transmitters. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. transmitters in the sensor where it'll Bluetooth it over to your smart device. Okay. Uh, another question was, do you have any information on the number, the percentage of T1D people who have had a viral infection prior to uh, diagnosis, mono or something like that. Mm, it's probably out there. I mean, a lot. I would say a lot of times um, doctors may not go looking for, you know, Epstein Barr or CMV. These are uh, or flu or well, flu. We do check, but if you do come into the hospital with type one diabetes, we usually just tr we. You're frozen, doctor, so we have to repeat this. Oh. I think he may need to um, hop off and hop back on if you can hear us. Let's see. See if I can. You would try to message him directly and see if he can see that. Yeah, I will do and that. And then we'll get the uh, the other questions uh, asked as soon as we finish that. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about all the technical okay. difficulties in this. Ah. It may have been a problem. They may have a connectivity problem at the hospital. Yeah, that's sounds, a place it you feels like it. I think that's a place you don't want connectivity. Problems. Yeah, <laughs> there he is. He's back. All right. Okay. All right. Glad to see you back. Okay. Okay. Keep on yeah. rolling. I don't know what yep. I what you guys last heard. Yeah. Well, um, that, that whole answer froze up. The whole answer. Oh. Um, yeah. One so suggestion story. somebody had is that if you have your video on, maybe go and turn it off if it's um, not you, doctor, but um, or you, Jack. It, it might help the feed if there's, I don't know, maybe something's going on with the internet right now, but that's mm -hmm. just a suggestion. Okay. All right. So, so it was the in viral infection concept and whether that's how right. much of that is a factor in diagnosis of diabetes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a factor. Um, a lot of times we don't check viral um, antibodies to see which virus causes type 1 diabetes. Um, so we probably can't say with certainty because of that lack of information how many percent of people get type 1 after viruses. Okay. Uh, another question is, um, do routine annual blood tests give you your A1C and how do you find out? So if you go in for your annual physical or your wellness test is, and they take a blood test, do you assume that A1C is part of that test? And if so, obviously the answer is ask your doctor, but if so, how do you find out? Yeah, so it's not part of routine physicals. They will indirectly check um, for diabetes with a fasting blood sugar, as long as you do a fasting lab. Um, so there's a chemistry panel that a glucose will be included with it. That's how a lot of doctors will see 
if somebody's glucose is elevated. Um, oftentimes, you just have to ask your doctor to check your A1C if you have a family history, um, history of gestational diabetes, um, if you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, like I said, the larger waist circumference. Those are reasons why A1Cs should be checked, but it's not always done. Okay. I, that's all the questions at this point, and I want to let you finish, but I just want to throw in one thing. Because yes. we entitled this endocrinology in general, oh. there are some interests in other things besides diabetes, and I'm not sure where if you're going to that, but one of the things came in that they were interested in hormonal changes as we age, and that might be another discussion, or maybe you have time tonight to, to address that. I will. I'll, I got maybe eight or 10 slides and I can try to answer all the questions af afterwards. Okay, that's Inter great. I'll Endocrinology is such a huge topic. Um, yep. We'll be sitting here until tomorrow morning and cover 10% <laughs> of it. Okay, well, we'll get what we can. <laughs> so, okay, I'm gonna try to minimize. Oh, let's see, there we go. All right, so can you hear me still? Yes. Okay, because I, yep. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to where we were. All right. So I was just going to talk about things that we can do um, to help reduce our risk of diabetes. And a lot of this focuses on healthy foods and getting more active. Usually one does not work as well if, if you just do one. So there's lots of diet plans that are available. If you go to the checkout lane and look at the magazines, you'll see how one is so much better than the other. Um, really, it's individualized on which one will work best for you from food choice um, desires, cost goes into it, and, um, and, uh, and uh, many, many other things. So there's low carb, there's carnivore diets, there's vegan diets, there is something called the plate method. Plate method is you try to fill half of your plate with veggies, a quarter with um, a grain, and a quarter with protein. DASH diet, which is used for blood pressure lowering, a plant-based diet, and then Mediterranean, which I'll talk on that one more in a few slides. Uh, but really, a lot of these um, diets have common denominators. They want you to eat a portion control diet. In general, we want you to have lower processed foods, um, have little to no um, refined extra sugars put into your foods. A lot of veggies. You can have any veggie. Um, Non-starchy means um, essentially it's not potatoes, corn, and even some peas can be a little bit starchy. And then really to get, um, be mindful when you eat. If you eat, um, as I go to here, if you eat while you watch TV, eat while you're playing on your phone, um, doing some work, you don't really understand how the food's, you know, getting into your system, if you will. And if people don't get full as, as quick or they will eat quicker, um, this family in a perfect world would be talking to each other and you would eat, you know, much more slowly because there is a signal from our stomach that goes to our brain. It takes about 20 minutes to get there. Um, it's the satiety or our fullness hormone that tells us, yep, I don't need to eat any more food. And, and um, Dr. Ortel, um, are could you share your screen? I don't think we're seeing your slides. Oh, shoot. Um, I got. I'm going to bring my tech support over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was. I. I. We just gotten a couple of questions about that. I know. You're just. Sorry, everybody. Oh no, no worries. There we go. Yay. Okay. And, Sorry. Uh, yeah, you may want to make it full screen there, Al Allison. That yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Can you see it? That's all yeah. good. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So I'm going to go to the next screen. Oh, gosh. How do I move this up? I guess I can. There we go. I'll just use this. Time. There we go. Okay. Perfect. All right. Yeah. So this is the screen I, I was wanting you to see because um, this is how a lot of Americans will eat. We will eat in front of our TV, our pad, um, or kind of work over lunch or dinner. 
Um, and that's not a great way to eat because of what I was saying is you usually eat more quickly. You don't really taste your food, enjoy your food, and people tend to eat more. Um, and I was mentioning there's a digestive hormone essentially that goes from stomach to brain slowly over 20 to 30 minutes even where it just tells you, yep, you are full. So if you shovel food in your mouth in five or 10 minutes, you may feel that, ugh, I'm bloated at you know 20 or 30 minutes later, when if we eat more slowly, that signal goes to the brain and tells us we're less hungry, helps us eat more of a portion controlled diet. And then I'm gonna have a few words on the Mediterranean diet because I have a lot of people come in and say, what, what diet is the best for me? I usually talk with them, obviously, and see what's the best for them. But if they have no other preference, I think the Mediterranean diet is a great diet for a lot of people. Some research shows it can reduce diabetes and heart disease risks. Um, and this is just a quick little word saying um, every diet is individualized. There's a lot of them out there. But the American Diabetes Association and even the American Heart Association does suggest Mediterranean-style diet um, can help. Um, it's been around for a long time, as long as the Mediterranean has been around, which has been a long time. Um, it's popular with Greece and Italy and anywhere, anywhere in the Mediterranean. Um, and why is it healthy? It's really high in fruits and vegetables, fats that are healthy, whole grains, um, herbs and spices to season things over salts, um, and fish, dairy, um, poultry, um, is the white come more from the white meats are utilized more in that area more than the red meat and sweets are not that common um and really with the mediterranean diet it wants you to focus on exercise being active in addition to eating healthy and we all know the pyramid from how it how it used to how, how it's how it's been kind of pushed over the years with their baseline is really they want you to be active go take a dance class go for a walk to the store um, probably with the Mediterranean, go play soccer um, or some sport that's popular over there. Um, and then to eat a lot of healthy grains, veggies, fish, poultry, sweets infrequently, lots of water, and red wine is what they also would encourage people to have in, in moderation if you're of the age. So... Um, and quick words, I got like just a few slides left. Um, medications for diabetes, there's so many of them. I put this, I know you can't see it on your end and that's kind of on purpose. When you go see your doctors, um, this is kind of what we're thinking when we um, are treating you for diabetes. We're trying to use medicines that are cost-effective, but also can improve weight, heart disease, um, kidney health. And that's kind of what this is, is putting through. This is from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Um, quick word on metformin, because that's what most doctors will use first. It's been around for 60 years. Um, it actually was, I think initially one, in, it was being utilized for even like depression, if I'm, if I'm getting my history correct, but it found that it lowered blood sugar. It was derived from the French lilac plant. Um, we've, we've been using it since the 50s. Um, yeah, it's really safe, really effective, despite what Facebook or the internet may pop ups when, when may happen. I get that question a lot. Um, it's very safe. How does it work? It tells your liver not to release excessive amounts of sugar, um, which can be exaggerated in people with diabetes. And it also can make your body more sensitive to insulin. Um, what we hear a lot about in clinic is it can cause upset stomach loose stools, diarrhea. Um, if that happens, I usually suggest people get on extended release metformin and that can be much more gentle on the system or simply lowering the dose down. And I encourage them to take it with food. If you take it on an empty stomach, it works like a nice laxative. So if you take it with food, it's gonna be much more gentle on your stomach. And then what do we use next if metformin is not enough? Um, I try to have people think back to diet, think about activity. Can that be optimized in any way? If it can, that's the best treatment. If it can't, then we see um, how high is the blood sugar? Are we talking blood sugar is just slightly elevated or is it really high and the person's having um, symptoms from that? And we also like to know 
what other conditions does a person have? Do they have heart disease? Are they a little bit overweight or obese? Is there kidney problems? Um, and what type of, of budget, unfortunately, or what insurance will, will they cover? Um, and just this is my last slide, I believe. So insulin, insulin, some people, when I get, when I put them on insulin, they feel like they're a failure. It means that they're doing something wrong. Um, um, oftentimes it goes back to maybe an uncle was put on insulin. Then the next month he was on dialysis and the next year he passed away back in 1960s or 70s. That's not always the case. Um, sometimes insulin is the best thing to do um, to help the person feel better and have less um, potential complications of diabetes down the road. So when you start insulin, can you ever stop it? Um, it's a, that's a fact if you have type 1 diabetes, but really it's a myth. Um, I've had many, many people who I've seen in clinic who we've been able to stop, stop their insulin. It's painful. Not really. Um, it's probably more painful to prick your finger to check a blood sugar than it is to inject insulin. Um, it will cause diabetes complications, and that's also a myth. It's actually the opposite. It can help improve blood sugars to reduce any complications people have from diabetes. Okay. And like I said, that was that was that I was trying to go through diabetes in general, but I know endocrinology, we, we see people for thyroid conditions, osteoporosis, adrenal gland problems, pituitary gland problems. Um, so we're kind of like the Swiss army knife for medicine um, sometimes. So I'm going to answer, I'm going to fire away with any questions that you have. I had one more that came in, uh, and that is, should a diabetic do intermittent fasting? Frozen again? Did it frozen? <laughs> Did we freeze? I think he's frozen. I you wanted to hear the a, answer to that question. You, you gave him a question that broke the machine. <laughs> I'm <laughs> that, curious. That was Betty. Betty did Betty did it. Ah, some good questions coming in. Uh, maybe he I'll see if I can shoot him an email or message okay sorry about that uh, let's see it looks like they he might have signed off and he's trying to he sign did. on again yeah so we, we have that that question to ask him and and how aging affects the endocrine okay. system in general to ask Okay, there you are. Yeah, Welcome we back. crashed. We crashed the Zoom link again. Sorry, <laughs> you're too okay. popular. Yeah, we have a couple okay. of more questions. Jack, so, the, the question was: uh, Should a diabetic do intermittent fasting? If it fits their um, lifestyle, yes. Um, if they're on certain medications, they will want to talk to their doctor about those medicines before starting intermittent fasting. Those are medicines, so insulin, if you're on insulin, talk to your doctor, or if you're on a medicine like glipizide, glimepiride, or gliburide, those medicines may need to be adjusted if you want to start that, because those can cause low blood sugars if you don't eat until noon. All right. the, the next question was, how does aging affect the endocrine system in general? Ooh. Or does it? It 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 can yes um pretty much all the hormones can be affected by aging um we we do know like with um menopause obviously when you when you age and go through menopause estrogen goes from cycling up and down with our cycles to non measurable um after menopause um, with guys, we don't necessarily go through menopause, but we do have a natural decline in our testosterone, our own sex hormone that goes down by a few percent per year, sometimes quicker, um, with certain health conditions. Um, gosh, our growth hormone, um, can also go down as we, um, age. Thyroid, with thyroid, um, generally the TSH number that, um, this this is people who don't have any thyroid problems. 
Um, TSH is something we measure for thyroid that tends to actually, in a normal fashion, increase as we get older, where uh, if a normal TSH is three, sometimes at age 80 and 90, five, six, or maybe even seven could be considered normal. Um, there's a big study for people who want to read called the European Aging it's, called, it's the European Aging um, Study, or Aging Male, I think is what it's also called. But there's, it, there's a lot of overlap between, between men and women with that study. So yeah, many things um, came to came get, get affected. That is all. Hand raised. Or, if you have any other questions, yeah, however you want to handle this. Any, uh, any yeah. more Paula questions? Has question. Paula has yeah. a question. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was me. And you you brought it up there fine about the hormones. But that's what I wanted to even share in, in general, because that's what I've been able to see over the years that when, okay, I'm going to say like for a woman who's had men who's had a hysterectomy, mm -hmm. that ended up affecting my hormones in balance so bad, I began me, it was affecting my insulin levels. Okay. And my and I then I would fall, I'd go down to low blood sugar and end up in the hospital. Oh. And it took the doctor six months. Mayo Clinic had me in the hospital. They were they were guessing off, but nobody said, Well, what did you eat? And it got, but so that's an angle that I was concerned of. And then, like you said, synthroid or thyroid levels, I've just been living like lately, but sometimes when we age. We don't need as much synthroid. Is mm -hmm. that true? Because I, I told my doctor, no, no, no. I've been on this level for years. She says, no, it's too high. So I want to know for other people, we all have, especially women, thyroid's a big issue out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so for, for women, um, usually if they're young um, of reproductive age, I usually try to keep the TSH number maybe 2.5 or less. Um, and then as people begin to age and not um, need, or as they go through menopause, especially if a TSH is maybe three or four, that could be considered normal, but it really depends on the person, how they're feeling, other, other medical conditions. If the person does not have any thyroid problems, and we just, if we were to measure like their TSH um, yearly as they get older, um, the body um, compensates by increasing their TSH which is a pituitary hormone that travels to our thyroid and it re then releases the, like the T4 hormone. This is complex, I know, but the, it, that signal increases to maintain the same amount of thyroid hormone that your thyroid can make. So that's why if, if, if you have somebody who's 82, they feel okay, their TSH is 4.8. Some doctors may not necessarily put them on medication Whereas if that same person was 32, where they may suggest medications to them. Okay. Does that answer your question, Paula? I... Okay, well, just a bit more to it though. Since yeah. we're you're talking on a group with mostly retired people here, mm -hmm. isn't the thyroid issue a pretty major one? Low thyroid is very common for older women over 50. Yeah, it's more Not common. Not everybody I know has to take some kind of thyroid. Yeah, so it's more common in women than men for certain. Um, it usually gets diagnosed in kind of early to middle adulthood. Um, it seems like after a year after delivery is really um, from pregnancies when a lot of women get started on it, they develop postpartum thyroiditis, which can persist um, later in life. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a big issue. With women, it's probably six times more likely than men. And if you have a family history of thyroid issues, it could go up to 10 times more likely um, with women. Okay. Are there any more questions? We have time for about one more question. If anybody wants to, I can't, I can't, I have a smaller screen, so I can't always see anybody. So if anybody wants to unmute to ask a question, please feel free to do so. It looks like Kay has a question. Okay. Yeah, so it seems then it's sort of normal for an older woman to be on the thyroid medication. Um, correct. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I, I percent wise, I don't know. It, it could be maybe along the lines of 25, 30, 40 percent of women could 
have thyroid issues. Mm -hmm. Don't put me to that one, but it is, at least in my clinic, yeah, quite a bit of, of women are on thyroid medications because that's right. who gets kind of referred over to see us. And has that the current sort of thyroid medicine that's been you that's being used has that been around for a long time? So yeah, levothyroxine and synthroid are the usual right. medicines. Those have been around. Oh my gosh, I'd probably say a hundred years. We used to use. Oh, really? I think it's been around that long. Don't again, don't quote me. I didn't come prepared for these types of questions, but yeah, that's it's been around for a long period of time. Yeah. Um, just seems to, I mean, a lot of myself and other friends my age, we are all on thyroid medicine and it seems yeah. like it works and doesn't have any really side effects. It's just helping keep that balance there. Yeah, yeah. So if you have the dose correct and the levels look good, it shouldn't cause any you know, side effects with, with the person. Yeah. All right. Good. All right. All right. Um, I, th I think we're getting to the point where we're going to have to say our thank yous. Any other questions real quick? I have a quick one. I, at least I hope it's a quick one. I recently read of Alzheimer's being called type 3 diabetes, and it really didn't explain why they were calling it that. And I was wondering what that relationship was, if if you know. What, what was the illness? Alzheimer's. 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 They were calling it the type three diabetes, and I'm, it, but it didn't explain. Hmm. I, I've not heard that myself. That's okay, interesting. Type three. I'll have to. I it, it, was, I don't know. it was on AARP. So. Okay. That was. I will. I'll get back to my office and I'll Google it. I'll if, wait a little you, yeah. <laughs> Doctor, if am. you have. Any uh, any information on that? We and you could pass along. We're we'd be glad to pass it on to the viewers tonight. We can do that as well. Okay. Okay. All right. That. So I think uh, I think we're gonna have to call it time. It's uh, one minute till, and uh, we really appreciate the time and effort. And uh, like you said, it's a huge subject, and maybe a subject that you know we can talk to Allison about approaching from a different angle in our further series. We have, you know, more to do with LMH. Uh, I will remind everybody that next month is the Tai Chi in person at the auditorium, not a Zoom. Um, and that should be a lot of fun. And then if I'm correct, Allison, LMH is gonna take a few months off for the summer and they'll be back in the fall with, uh, with us then. And in the interim, uh that's correct right allison one yep, more yep we okay. typically yep and, correct okay and then in the interim we're looking we you, we have already put up one about nutrition and we're going to try to get some more health related type uh events uh and zooms in that three month period at the same time to kind of continue along the health care item until we can get back to LMH in the fall. Perfect. All right. So thank you very much, doctor. Thank you, Allison. We really Lots appreciate it. In the chat. Thank you so much. And yes, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks again, folks. Thank you.